Dear Directors of Greenstone Gold Mines, Life in the North is immensely different from the life you know in Southern Ontario. You might not be able to understand just how different it is, so we thought the best way to let you into our world would be to hear firsthand about some of the challenges the people of Erlan, Kinigamin, and AZA and Anishinaabek First Nations face in taking advantage of the economic opportunities your mining project represents. This is a story of investment, investment in infrastructure, in education, well-being, and in health. But ultimately, it is a story about unlocking human potential. You need a stable, skilled, reliable local workforce for the duration of gold mining in the Greenstone area. We need and want the employment. However, our people often live in substandard housing, eat substandard food, and are dealing with substance abuse issues either themselves or in their families. These conditions do not make it easy for our members to be the ideal workers they want to be and the ideal employees you need. No one chooses poverty. Wealth disparity and poverty are barriers to our community's ability to access even the best opportunities and is a huge barrier to our health outcomes, particularly those of our children. To ensure secure living conditions and opportunities for our members, it is vital that we address the issues that hinder the well-being of our communities. Our First Nations have big plans to improve living conditions and community well-being to prepare our people for what is to come. We know what needs to happen. What we need are the funds to make it happen. Our hope is that once you understand us better, you'll see how an investment from you will benefit us all. Welcome to our reality. I would see developed communities, I would see people that are prospering, I would see people with careers, I would see uh, this town booming again. And if everything's all done right with the money and that, uh, I mean, you could see people that have overcame their addictions, uh, more rec teams, more ongoing, uh, just more of everything like, uh, you know, you'd have a better gym, you'd have a, like better ball fields. Uh, the arena would be fixed up, but you know, and then you, your parks and all that as well would be fixed up. Uh, AZA would be fully developed and you know, a fully running operational community with people living on there. Who knows, maybe one day me and my children will be running around and if I ever have any. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I can see it going great if they make this investment and, you know, uh, nothing but positive opportunity can arrive, like, derive from it. I think it would be, this investment would definitely be really great and you'd see a lot, a lot more people um, in a better place. You can't be rich in a poor town because it just it won't work out. Nobody, like, you're not going to be rich forever. So it, everybody would have to have a better life, so we need to have a better life here. Everybody would have to have more income and better housing and uh, better transportation and money to spend so then I could have a more successful life. So it's just, things are going to have to change here for the, to be more successful. Success looks like being able to take care of your own families without the help of anybody else. Being able to buy your own car, being able to um, build your own house on your land, being, like, being able to hunt and fish on that land that you just built that house on, being able to take care of yourself without asking anybody else for anything. What would be different if anything is ever going to change here now, man, is that uh, the, the, uh, the First Nation people got to be involved. And like uh, what I talked about earlier in all aspects of uh, the development. And I think that's one of the main things that I love about here is that all of us as a community take care of one another. And um, we're just like one big family always having each other's back. And it's, it's just a really safe place. You don't have to worry about being afraid when you're here and the second thing that I love about here is, is it's just it's beautiful no matter what season 
it is because we're surrounded by the bush. It's just, it's absolutely beautiful. It doesn't matter how much money you make or how many things you have. It's as long as you're content with the life that you're living, then you're successful. If we fix up our community, people want to belong to our community. Not, not be here because they're from here. They want to come back. Like we have met a lot of members off reserve that are all across Canada. And if we could be, be able to build a, a thriving community with, with all the infrastructure that we need, they'll want to come back and be able to work, work to have jobs here and be able to make a good living here. I want to be able to stay here and build a business here and live here and have a family here. But I don't know which way it's going to go yet. It would be so great if they would take the time and meet some of these people, visit some of these communities, and, and just see how they live. A lot of these uh, people want work, but there's nothing for them. You hear some people say, oh, they're lazy, but they're not. They, they can't find the work. My son, he works for the beers, but that's closing in, in, at Wapscott. He's gone for an interview in, in Cochrane, but it would be nice if he could get a job here too because this is where his family lives. Everybody wants to work. Like They can't live and don't want to live in poverty. They don't choose to live the way they're living. Everybody needs a job around here. Like Everybody's always searching for jobs, so if they had the opportunity and the training, anybody's going to jump on that and start working. So I would even do it. I'd even take that training and go jump on the job working at the mine. Right now, it seems like it's an easy thing to do, to go uh, get your training. But that doesn't give you the experience on the machinery that is required for somebody to give you the, uh, the trust in their million dollar equipment for you to be running. All these people in Ireland at one time worked for a big logging company, Kimberly Clark. So these, these people are all uh, experienced heavy equipment operators. But they can't get jobs now anywhere because they don't have education. So you guys are going to be asking for grade 12s. None of these people got grade 12. How are you guys going to promise to give us jobs? You know, you might be able to hire people to jump in a rock truck and that right away, but you know, you want those great jobs for people too that they can make a career out of, like, you know, being able to go into human resources or any sort of position like that. So with the way the high school is going here, that there's been such major cuts with the uh, classes and that that they don't necessarily have the options to be able to pick their classes that's needed to get into certain programs in university and that, so there's a barrier there. Well, the potential would be there for them to offer courses in those areas that would support the mining industry. I know if we had a high school, we would certainly be creating those courses or having those courses available to the students. Uh, so my name is Bill Bokash. I'm the principal here at Johnny Terrio School in Ireland. My name is Marlo Sobush. I am a First Nation myself. I belong to Lake Helen First Nation. Our children are very loving uh, people. They come to school with um, the attitude that they want to learn they obviously love coming in. There are hugs and good mornings and I miss you and have good weekends. They're very enthusiastic to learn and they're just absolutely fantastic children. They graduate from Johnny Terrio School. They go to Geraldton Composite High School and they are on their own. I have many, many concerns with the high school going there. First of all, the busing. Why do we have to send our kids out to different communities when there's so much money that's going to be here? Why can't we build a better and bigger school so we can keep them in our community instead of sending them all over the place? 
for sending high school kids who are 13 and 14, and they're still young, into a high school environment with absolutely no support, uh, nobody there to advocate for them. Um, you know, parents here are doing the best that they can, but are at a loss because they don't live in Geraldton, in that community, to go to the high school to provide that support. And then when they're not supported, um, the answer that they have for the kids is to bring them from an academic or applied level down to a locally developed level, which really leads them nowhere when they, uh, when they graduate, if they graduate from the high school. So it's a really dismal situation. Um, I'm doing my high school online right now. I went to Geraldton for my, like, I'm supposed to be graduated from high school right now, but I'm finishing my five courses online with Contact North. It's a lot easier, to be honest, because when I was living in Beardmore, it was an hour and a half bus ride just to get to school. So we'd leave 6, uh, 6.45 in the morning, we'd get to school around 8.30, and we wouldn't be home until 5 o'clock, 5.30 at night. So now I have time to go to work and time to do school at the same time. So. That's my biggest push at this moment, is on our own high school and the programming that we could put in as a community whatever we wanted to teach them our own culture most of all. We would really love to be able to see an e-learning high school take place where students are being able to tap into any classroom across Ontario whatever it is that they need to be able to move forward to pursue whichever career they want. We also want this to be an adult education learning facility. I, I think there's huge potential here to support the community. We just need to put it all into a nice, fine building. Brick and mortar. Brick and mortar. That's kind of what we're looking for. But if I can make a, a suggestion to the company, is that they also have to reach out to the high school and start to make that, form that partnership to perhaps have a co-op system in place for those children to come and learn that trade and mm -hmm. to learn that craft so that it could pique their interest into going into that field of study. So I think it has to be a, um, a two-way two street. street. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the partnership has to be formed. And I know that if we were to ever have the high school, well, of course, we would certainly want to form that partnership with the company to allow these children to have those opportunities. I would love to live on the First Nation again, but sadly I can't because there is, there's no housing and there's no money for housing. I've been on a list since I was 18. I'm now 28. <laughs> you know, there's only the few that they're making and then there's so many families that need housing, so. But if, uh, like if, yeah, if the mine would come here and the jobs would be here and the guys want to move back, it would be, uh, it would be uh, tough for me to uh, try to house the people that want to move back home. Uh, housing in Ireland is, uh, it's been a battle, just like with any other First Nations community. We can't do too, a, a whole lot at one time. We can do a little bit at a time. Look for funding each, uh, each fiscal year there, and put my applications in, proposals, and. Sometimes we get lucky and sometimes we don't and do what we can to renovate some houses or build new homes. There are some houses that uh, were so bad that uh, like all the drywall has to be done pretty much. We have to gut the whole places. There's uh, holes. Their furnaces are in so bad of a shape. The bottoms are falling out of them and they're still using them. Because to replace that, you're looking at probably 2,500 bucks, and 2,500 bucks they don't have. Like a lot of it's got to do is with the families don't have income, so you know they're not they're unable to fix a lot of these houses themselves. So the government takes sometimes three or four years before they can come up with some uh, funding to fix these houses. So they have to live that way for you know, quite some time. You know, it's it's 2017, you don't think people should be living like that these days, but there is. 
Oh, and a little tour around Ginnogamine First Nations. Here's a couple houses that are very old. This one here is getting torn down next summer. This one here should be torn down. What's wrong with them? Just Mold issues. Roof is way too old. Like if there was no snow on there, you could see the shingles just falling off. And there's, here's the mold again. And as you can see, I, like once I said it once again, uh, I have to clean it once a week. And I'll come back. I'll come back and then it'll be there and maybe even twice as much. And yeah, just like what I said up here too. As you can see, those little spots, spots, the spots, the spots, the spots. Right here, as you can see, like right here on the ceiling, there's more. I have no clue what that's called. I know it's due to the poor, uh, uh, the leak, leak, I guess it's leaking from the roof, I guess. Yeah. I have to keep it pretty much insulated because in the wintertime it's, uh, it's very oh, freak yeah, man, for sure. And it's also not, uh, I don't like, I wouldn't care if I lived here, like, but I got two kids, so, you know, I have to worry, worry about my kids' health and, you know, like, concern about my kids and shit, so. Back in my house there, the one I was living in next door, it used to freeze up like this so bad. With all my windows, I'd never be able to open it. And there'd be days in the winter where the jam would freeze up in here. I'd have to call somebody to come let me out of my house. This is the house they're renovating now. It was uh, built sometimes in the 70s. It's a 2 by 4 structure house. Totally not the code. The water and sewer pumps out the... Uh, excrements from houses. Lots of histories, the all time plugs up, you can't keep up. This bridge was built, I guess, somewhere in the 60s by KC. And it's just, it's just a one lane bridge. You're looking at the beams not touching the ground, like the bridge is actually, actually hanging some parts, like it's just being held up from the ground here and the ground on the other side and it's pretty rough underneath everybody wonders about it collapsing because when you see those heavy trucks that come from uh, from the mill they'll f fly through there and you'll see it literally shaking if we didn't have that bridge it would it would take at least well over an hour to get around just to get into the town um, transportation is a big thing if they don't have a car and they don't have anybody to give them a ride. There's no buses going up and down here, no taxis. So that's a big deal too. Do you think people would make healthier choices if they had better access to healthier food? Yeah. Yeah, they would, yeah. yeah. It's just that it's too expensive. It's too expensive. To buy yeah. vegetables and fruit, yeah. milk products. Okay, when we when we want to go shopping, we have to pay eighty to hundred dollars just to go shopping in Jolton. Yeah. And it's only yeah. one hour away, 45 yeah, minutes away. It's here. only 45 minutes away from here, and that's how much we pay just to go get our groceries. It'd be perfect <clears> to see uh, like uh, little shuttle vans and little yeah. buses yeah, take the workers yeah. from the community back and forth to the mine. Mm -hmm. That'd be amazing. You know, it's fun and it's great being able to live off the land, and I love that part of my rides, but sometimes it's not because I do it by choice or not because the people do it by choice, it's because they have to. I went and uh, I went to see one of the elders uh, oh, a month ago and she put her bills out on the table, what she has to pay out, and she showed me exactly what was coming in. She has to pay out double for what's coming in. So in the summertime, they go out and uh, pick berries and pick cones and stuff like that. And there are 70 some year old people now that still have to work to make ends meet. Because we've got younger kids and grandsons, and they need to learn all about the wildlife and how to eat them and what to live on. <laughs> and you can't afford the meat in town here. <laughs> we'll get some moose. <laughs> That's all we have stocked in our freezers, dear meat fish, um, moose meat, rabbit, partridge, 
That's what my dad cooks all year long. So. Good. <laughs> We've actually had a power outage for almost three days, I think, one year in the summertime, and everybody's food spoiled. I think uh, we were working on it at one point where, like, especially wild food, like, you can't, you have to go out hunting again if it gets spoiled. In the summer, it's not bad, you know, it's warm. But if uh, we have power outages in the winter, it's awful. Oh, you know, it's, and it's hours, not three hours, it's like 10 hours before the power comes back on. We do have frequent power outages where, like say, a client that is on di the home dialysis, they have to do a manual drip kind of thing. I love to see improvement with the hydro. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, electrical services would be nice. The biggest concern for me would be the uh, sudden influx of uh, money coming into this town with the economic boom since there's a substantially bad uh, substance abuse problem here uh, without any proper programs or anything to deter the people away from that. You find lots more support when you leave your community and lots of people don't want to leave the community because that's their home. So if you want to go help that means you have to leave the community that means that you don't have that sense of home so when you come back home and you're all better you're all healed it's you're restarting everything over because you didn't get that help there and you got your help from strangers it's kind of just like this big cycle and you can't break it unless there's help for you at home since we have the suboxone program and an aftercare program right on the reserve so that um, the members don't need to go into the town I think having uh, that program on our reserve has really benefit um, our community members because you know the nurse that you're talking to and you know that um, she's not judging you and it's a safe place. For First Nations kids, like lots of us don't know our culture, but if you did know your culture, it's like it's, it's one of the best ways to heal because that's who you are and that's you're healing just by doing which, doing something that, where you belong to, if that makes sense. But, like, um, I know in Long Lac in Nigamin, um, they have like little cultural sessions where like, you'll go, all the kids from the community will come together in the rec center and they'll do breathing and they'll do, they'll make their moccasins or they'll make a little baby, a little things for the baby and stuff, just so they have something to take home and be like, oh yeah, look what mommy made you. This is what our culture is. Mm -hmm. Is that so it gives you kind of like a hope, like, you know, even though we are maced stuck here, it's not so bad because this is where we belong and we actually can live here, we're actually healthy here. We just have to realize it and work together to make it better. Some people went through a really hard time and the only way they know how to combat the issues that they have is by numbing themselves. So just to be able to have all those resources at hand would be great, but those resources cost money. With the mine, there's going to be great jobs coming up, so you want to be clean for that, and, you know. And then with that being said, if the mine was to invest, you can help save these people's lives. So not only will they be helping with the development of communities and that, and, developing their capacity for their workforce, they'll be saving lives at the same time too. I mean, there's a lot of positivity that can happen with the investment. Well, right now, our, our youth, they don't have anywhere to go right now. Like, our younger younger generation, they have the school here, but the school is uh, is uh, maxed with uh, activities they tr they have to hold for the community. So I would like to see uh, a youth center or somewhere, somewhere for our youth to hang out in the winter time and uh, give them a place to hang out and be safe. The general things like a, an ice rink or a baseball field, something as simple as that can, you know, be a child or a, a youth's, um, Savior. 
skating. Well, we have an outdoor rink, but it's not heated or anything. So like we get the weather like minus 40 sometimes. I would like to see um, our community have a, a fitness gym. There is a gym located within the town, but of course it's ridiculous prices for membership and the, the people within the town are, um, not everyone is very nice. And it would uh, promote a healthy lifestyle if we got a new gym fitness center. Yeah. Yeah, everyone would be in top shape. Yeah. Health. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be very healthy. Yeah. More land-based stuff as well, like cultural stuff to, to get the kids out in the bush for physical activity. Like all these things can probably reduce the diabetes rate. We used to have a restaurant here, and. You know, that was the coolest thing ever. And that would be like, that would be awesome to bring that back. You know, to have a place for people to go. Um, an elders building, like we do have some programs for elders, but we have, we host it in this room and it's a very small room. Uh, it's usually packed in here when we do have programs. Our elders right now don't have our, their own uh complex to like a fourplex or a sixplex to house our elders and they're living in uh, regular houses where we have to build ramps for them and different things just to just to get keep them comfortable in their house. It's so sad when uh, our elders have to leave the community you know it just uh, breaks their hearts because they have to relocate they have it, we can't accommodate them here. They have no kind of, nothing to accommodate them where they have to eventually go to long term in Geraldton. Eh? So if we had extra money, I would build a, a nice, uh, nice elders complex and start with our elders, make them comfortable, and, or dis and the disabled too, because we got a lot of disabled uh, people in the community. They never even they probably never even try to come and talk like heart to heart and saying, how's your life, how's your life going? You know, what's bothering, what's making you not want to go out and work? Because they would probably like, tell you, you know, I can't work, I have my kids at home, I have nobody to babysit, I don't have money for a babysitter, I don't have people to watch my kids when I'm gone, I can't put them into a daycare or anything like that. Like, bet you if they sat down and like, they're not just, nobody's lazy, everybody just doesn't have the same opportunities as other people do. And it's expensive to hire a babysitter every day. You know, you'd be lucky if you find one that will take $75 a day, right? Yeah, wow. there's a lot of women around here that have a lot of kids and they're not working right now because there's no daycare. And all my friends are about my age and they all, they all have kids themselves already. So they're struggling even just to live. And, you know, their boyfriends or their men are trying to get jobs, but nobody wants to hire a guy who's uneducated and he can't go to school because he's got kids and, and she tries to go to school. And, gets kind of hard, I guess. Or if they don't both have jobs, but they both want to pursue training in that, well, then that's even harder because now they can't, they don't have the funding to put their child in the daycare, and they don't have the, they barely have the funding to go and uh, just live because they're both in training only, and the training dollars that you get half the time for your live-outs is pennies. But I think the other piece that's really, really missing, like the big gap, is the early years programming for these kids. Like there's no, there's no parent taught drop-in center. It's almost shocking when for the first time you see little JKs in the gym and you give them a ball and they don't know what to do with the ball. I mean, a lot of our families are big, they're busy, they have other kids that they need to deal with, they have other issues and priorities they're dealing with. So to have an early years social center, I want to call it, I think would be a great advantage for not only the school, but for the community and for the parents. Um, something the size of like this building would be nice. And maybe even go for like a business program to like run the whole place. That'd be awesome too. And then hire the people, hire the moms or people that really want to get into work. That'd be good for them. Awesome. Yeah, it'd be perfect, yeah, yeah. It would be perfect, yeah. yeah.
So if the mine decided to make this investment that you guys are asking for, what's in it for them? What's in it for the mine? Well, um, good karma, first of all. <laughs> uh, secondly, I mean, it would further the relationship between the First Nations, the people, and the mine itself, you know. How about we came onto your house or your land and we dug up a hole in your backyard and we took your treasure chest and we took it back home and then I told you that, oh, we'll give you 20,000 20, and I can keep your treasure chest. And they're like, no, I think that's things been in my family like for a very long time. I want 50,000 for that. I'll be like, no, 50,000 is too much. It's mine. I did all the work. I took it all out. I, my, all, I got all my mental dirty for this, so it's mine. How do you think they're going to feel? That's the exact same thing that they're doing to us. It's time that we start getting benefits and getting recognized that, you know, these are our lands, these are traditions, these are our territories. And, you know, we're not asking much, you know. They've had it all these years, you know. <laughs> Come on, share now. It's time to share. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, everybody will be happy because we deserve it. Just like anybody else. So there you have it. We would love for you to come and visit our communities, to meet our families and your future employees. In the meantime, we look forward to working with Greenstone Gold Mines to lay the foundations necessary to provide the mine with healthy employees who are ready to work. With the national momentum behind reconciliation and the shift towards First Nations sovereignty and jurisdiction, we believe better days for our communities lie ahead. We invite you to play your part in making our vision a reality.